a very good evening aspirants today before going to the news articles discussion session i have an announcement for you this announcement is regarding shankar ice academy's new initiative regarding csat paper shankar ice academy has designed a refresher course called as csat plus This is for those aspirants who score good marks in GS paper in prelims but find it difficult to qualify in the Civil Services Aptitude Test paper which is called as CSAT paper. So to help the students to easily qualify for CSAT, Shankar IS Academy has come up with this initiative. This course starts on 27th January 2022 and its class timing for this course will be from 5:30 p.m. to 8 p.m. The program is also available in online mode. and the admission for this program is open now and by signing up for this course you will be having the benefit of complete overview of csat course you'll get to know about the shortcuts for time management and accuracy you'll get to have interaction with the toppers you'll learn the strategy to select easy questions and eliminate the difficult ones and you'll also learn about the strategy to improve and manage the english skills along with this you will also get topic wise previous year csat paper analysis so the course comes with all these benefits so those who want to register for this program visit the link that is given in the description of this video so now let us move on to the hindi news analysis for the date 24th of january 2022 these are the list of news articles taken for today's discussion and today these two articles will be discussed by me and the remaining two articles will be discussed by our other faculty so now let us get to the first discussion So today we are going to start our discussion with this news article which talks about a petition that focuses on an important provision in marriage laws this provision is called as the restitution of conjugal rights so in this discussion let us see what is the conjugal right then we'll see the legal provisions related to it we will also see about the observations of various courts and committees on these provisions and then we'll see the petition mentioned in the news article the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference So basically marriage means a recognized union of two people as partners and they are in a personal relationship and this marriage is recognized formally and legally but remember marriage is simply not just a union between two individuals but it is also a social institution it has legal economic cultural and religious ramifications that is consequences that is why there is a need to list the norms of a marriage and along with it the legitimacy of a marriage has also needs to be ensured now these are mentioned or dictated generally by the laws regarding marriage and divorce that is the matrimonial laws they are mentioned in prevailing social norms and also through religious dictates and when we take the matrimonial laws particularly they consider marriage as a union that impose certain marital duties upon each of the spouses and it also gives certain legal rights to each spouse so according to the laws marriage imposes certain duties and also provides certain legal rights the one of the rights that is provided or imposed by the matrimonial laws is the conjugal rights so what is a conjugal right First of all here the term conjugal means relating to marriage or relating to the relationship between a married couple so conjugal rights are the rights and privileges in a marriage or we can say it is the rights and privileges among married couple so it includes the intimate rights of marriage such as mutual relationship of comfort companionship affection and even sexual relations so pay attention here such conjugal rights also includes sexual relations and sexual intimacy among the married couple so this is what is generally assumed now according to courts in india for having conjugal rights two ingredients are actually necessary the first key ingredient is cohabitation that is the married couples should live together for ensuring comfort consortium that is the companionship and the second one is the sexual intercourse that is the married couples have to consummate the marriage so this is the basics that you need to know about conjugal rights now having conjugal right is not wrong but the problem lies in the matter that it is legally enforceable under matrimonial laws in our country that is the conjugal right is legally enforceable under legislations and this legal enforceability is what is called as the restitution of conjugal right so let us understand what this term actually means see here restitution means return or restoration so this provision regarding restitution of conjugal right prescribes the restoration of conjugal rights through a decree by a court of law 
now here the restoration of uh, something is needed when a particular thing is compromised so in this case the restoration of conjugal right is needed maybe because one of the two ingredients of the conjugal rights is compromised or both the ingredients are compromised that is either the spouses are not cohabiting or they are not having any sexual relations or both that is they are not cohabiting and having sexual relations so here both the ingredients are compromised now the action of not cohabiting and denying sexual relation is referred as withdrawing from the society of the other in the matrimonial laws not only this the withdrawing from society would also mean that the spouse is not doing the actions that are necessary for fulfilling marital obligations so when this happens without any valid reason that is when one spouse leaves the house or uh, when one spouse refuses for sexual relations without any valid reason then the other spouse can approach the court and ask for restitution of conjugal rights that is for restoration of conjugal rights so here you should note the term without any valid reason when they withdraw from the society without any valid reason then the provisions regarding restitution of conjugal rights will be applicable and here the spouse who will be filing this petition will be the aggrieved spouse so after hearing the case the court can order the husband or the wife to join back with his or her family that is here the husband or the wife will be ordered to cohabit with the other spouse and they will also be ordered to take part in sexual intercourse but here there is a contradiction actually because some legal sources say that courts cannot order to consummate the marriage that is it cannot order for sexual intercourse through the decree of restitution of conjugal rights but the court can only order for cohabitation this may be true but the issue here is our country does not have a law that criminalizes marital rape of women above the age of 15 years so that means this gives a way for the possibility that this cohabitation will lead to the husband sexually forcing the wife which is nothing but the marital rape so this is where the restitution of conjugal rights and marital rape laws are related through the restitution of conjugal rights the courts can order one of the spouse to live with the other spouse now when this happens the courts cannot ensure that the husband is not forcing the wife or the wife is not forcing the husband sexually so if there is a law that criminalizes marital rape of women above the age of 15 years then we can definitely say that things like marital rape would not happen or at least there will be a deterrence now coming back to restitution of conjugal rights now which are the important laws that provides for this particular provision see actually almost all matrimonial laws in our country provide for it for example for hindus it is provided under the uh, hindu marriage act of 1955 the section 9 of hindu marriage act talks about restitution of conjugal rights then if you take christians they can avail the same provision under section 32 and 33 of indian divorce act of 1869 then even the parsis have this provision under their uh, parsi marriage and divorce act of 1936 it is provided under section 36 of this 1936 act and then even the special marriage act provides this provision under section 22 i have given all the provisions in these laws here and you can see that these provisions have almost the same wordings but you should also note that these provisions are gender neutral so we can say that the provision of restitution of conjugal right is gender neutral under indian matrimonial laws that means here the wife as well as the husband can file a petition for restitution of conjugal rights now here this particular thing may look like a reasonable provision when the aggrieved party is wife for example if the husband has uh, deserted the wife without any valid reason then the wife can find a remedy through this provision because here the husband has deserted without any valid reason then if the wife files a petition for a remedy of restitution of conjugal right then the court can order that husband to go back to their family but the problem is unfortunately this restitution of conjugal right provision is often used against women it is mainly used when women want to concentrate on their career along with their married life because concentrating on their career is termed as withdrawing from the society by the husband Here the husband argues that due to their career and its related obligations the woman or the wife they want to move to other places so they are not focusing on the marriage with them so here mainly when the woman want to move to other places for her career prospects then husbands use this particular provision for making the wife to stay with them and then it is also used when the wife want to exercise their sexual autonomy privacy and individual dignity 
So in all these instances, this provision is used against women. And unfortunately, this argument is even accepted as a valid one even by the courts. And that is why this particular provision of restitution of conjugal rights places a disproportionate burden on women. And this mainly happens because of the patriarchal notion of marriage. See here, you should remember that this provision of restitution of conjugal right has its roots in feudal England. That is, it is present in England under their English law. At that time, in England, marriage was considered as a property deal and wife was considered as a part of a man's possession like other properties. So they had this restitution of conjugal rights saying that the wife has to obey the husband and has to stay with him. And when India was under the British rule, this provision was brought to India also and later it was instituted in the Hindu Marriage Act. So we can say that it was not opposed at that time in India, even because the courts even followed patriarchy when it came to marriage. Now I'm saying this statement mainly because of some of the statements made by courts in this regard. For example, in the past, courts have held that women should be like Sita and they should follow their husbands everywhere. And sometimes even courts have said that a woman's focus on their careers is a neglect of their household responsibilities. And they have also said that a wife's first duty to her husband is to submit herself obediently to his authority and to remain under his roof and protection. So you can see the patriarchy in these lines and you can see the status of those courts which said these statements. But we should not also forget that there are also some courts which have agreed that restitution of conjugal right has no validity in the modern life after Indian independence. So these courts have also agreed that now women are as educated as men and they are contributing to their family income. So they have equal rights like a man. And therefore, they have suggested for the abolition of the provisions relating to restitution of conjugal rights in the matrimonial laws. So there are also courts which said these humiliating statements about uh, women and there are also courts that have asked for abolition of this provision. Actually, this was even agreed by a high-level committee on status of women. This committee was under the Ministry of Women and Child Development and in 2015, this committee submitted its report and it suggested for abolition of the restitution of conjugal rights provision. The same was even agreed by the Law Commission of India in its 2018 report when it talked about family law reforms in India. So we can see that various institutions have suggested for abolition of this provision. So this must be applauded because at least now the debate on the removal of the provision relating to restitution of conjugal rights is happening, but it did not materialize yet. And this is where the current case which is mentioned in the news article is important because in this case a petition was filed which has challenged the validity of restitution of conjugal rights provision in Hindu Marriage Act and Special Marriage Act. Now this petition was filed long before but the problem was after July 2021 this petition has not been heard yet. So now activists are asking for the Supreme Court to decide on this case law as soon as possible. And we are also suggesting the same because even though the restoration of uh, conjugal rights has its roots in England, already England has abolished this provision in its laws in 1970s itself. But we in our Indian laws have not yet abolished this provision. So the Supreme Court has to decide on this matter as soon as possible because it also has implications on the marital rape provisions. So aspirants should take note of this particular right, which is the restitution of uh, conjugal rights that is provided by Indian matrimonial laws. And you should also take note of the marital rape related uh, provisions in the Indian laws. The points which we discuss in these two topics are important when we talk about the rights of women, particularly in their marriage. So in this discussion, we saw about conjugal rights. We saw what is it? We saw that it is the right given to the married couple and it is the right that exists between the married couple. And then we saw that there are two ingredients in conjugal rights. One is cohabitation and the second one is sexual intercourse. And then we saw that the restriction of uh, conjugal right comes into play when one of the key ingredients is compromised. So through the restriction of conjugal right provision, the court can order a spouse to live with the other spouse who has filed the petition and can also order for sexual intercourse according to some sources. And then finally, we saw the provisions in the Indian matrimonial laws that provides for uh, this restitution of conjugal rights. And then finally, we saw what the uh, different committees and even the Indian courts have to say about conjugal rights and this provision. So with these points in mind, now let us move on to the next discussion.
Now our next discussion is going to be based on this news article which reports that Omicron is now in community transmission in India. According to INSACOG that is Indian SARS-CoV-2 Genomics Consortium, Omicron has now become dominant in multiple metros because in these metros new cases are increasing dramatically. So in this context let us briefly understand what is this community transmission and the different stages of spreading of a disease. Let us see the definition given by World Health Organization. According to it, community transmission is when there is an increase in positive tests through sentinel samples. Sentinel sample mean the routine testing of respiratory samples from established laboratories. So when there is increase in positive tests, it will be called community transmission. It is also called community transmission when they are unable to link the confirmed cases through chains of transmission for a large number of cases. In other words, community transmission or community spread is said to be taking place when the source of the contagion is not known. That is, when they are unable to trace an infection back to the carrier who has traveled in an affected area or the carrier who has been in contact with a person having the infection, then in this scenario it will be called as community transmission. Now a state of community spread implies that the virus is now circulating in the community and it can infect people with no history. That is, they will not have any history of uh, traveling to the infected areas or they will not have any history regarding contact with any affected persons. So at this stage, it is said that it is theoretically possible for everyone to catch the infection. That is, when there is community transmission, then it is possible for everyone to catch the infection. So we have to be very cautious about this community transmission stage because the next stage to this community transmission is the stage of epidemic, which then again leads to pandemic. Now in this image you can see the four stages of transmission. The first stage is the imported cases. Now in this, cases are transported into a place where the virus did not originate in the early stages of a disease. And then it later becomes a pandemic sweeping the globe. It becomes a pandemic when the infection has spread across borders of one or few countries. For example, if you take COVID-19, Thailand was the first country to report a case of COVID-19 outside of China. And then we came to know that it has become a pandemic. So this was the first stage that is when the virus spreads to regions where it did not originate. Now the second stage is when the virus starts being transmitted locally. That is, this means local transmission. Here the source of the infection is from within a particular area and the path that the virus takes from one person to the next person is clearly established here. So here if from one country where the virus has originated has traveled to the other country then in that country it starts locally transmitting and we can clearly see the path as to how the virus has transmitted from one person to other person. Now the next comes the third stage which is community transmission and we saw about community transmission just now. Now the last stage is the stage of epidemic which then leads to pandemic. See, it is when the disease, that is in our case COVID-19, has spread majorly in a particular region and then it is going to spread to other regions also. See, generally, epidemic refers to an increase in the number of cases of a disease and this increase is above what is normally expected in that population in that particular area. So when there is such an increase, it will be called as epidemic and when this happens throughout the world or throughout the globe, then it will be called as pandemic. We actually saw about the definition of pandemic, endemic and epidemic on our Jan 15th news analysis. So those who want to clearly know the difference between these three terms, you can view that analysis. So with this, we have come to the end of this discussion on community transmission. Now let us move on to the next discussion which will be taken by our other faculty. I will come back in the prelims practice question session. Take a look at this article. This is from the text and context page. This news article is in reference to creation of Indian Environmental Service. See, in order to review the country's green laws and the procedure followed by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, the Environment Ministry set up a committee headed by the former Cabinet Secretary T.S.R. Subramanian. This committee was set up in August 2014 and was called as the Subramanian Committee. In its recommendations to the government, the committee proposed a National Environment Research Institute and an Indian Environment Service, that is IES. According to the committee, this will help the government to recruit qualified human resources in the environment sector. But a parliamentary standing committee rejected this report on the grounds that it diluted key aspects of environmental legislation. 
So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, we'll see in detail about what is this TSR Subramanian Committee report on environment, its recommendations, and some of the important points mentioned in the article. Before starting our discussion, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. Kindly go through it. Now you might get a doubt. How did the IES topic, that is the Indian Environment Service, become so prominent? See, a petition filed by lawyer Samar Vijay Singh argued that the matters of the environment required special expertise. Currently, matters of environmental regulation rests on the scientists of the Ministry of Environment and Forests, as well as the bureaucrats from the Indian Administrative Service. So, while responding to this plea, the Supreme Court asked the centre how it plans to establish such a mechanism. And this is how the whole IES topic became prominent. Now that we have seen how it gained the prominence, we shall see what is this TSR Subramanian Committee report on the environment. See, as I said already, the Subramanian Committee was set up in August 2014 to review the country's green laws and procedures followed by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. It suggested, that is the committee suggested several amendments to align with the government's economic development agenda. And finally, the report was submitted to the then Union Environment Minister. The committee had suggested amendments to almost all green laws, including those relating to environment, forest, wildlife and coastal zone clearances. The committee had three months to submit its report. After it did submit the report, a parliamentary standing committee rejected the report on the grounds that it ended up diluting key aspects of the environmental legislation designed to protect the environment. So this was the argument by the parliamentary standing committee regarding the report given by the Subramanian committee. The committee also suggested forming another committee with more expertise and time to review the environmental laws. So that's it about the committee. Now let us get into the recommendations given by the TSR committee. Let's see them one by one. The first one is the report proposed an Environmental Laws Management Act under which two expert bodies, the National Environmental Management Authority and the State Environmental Management Authority will be constituted at the centre and state levels. The primary function of these two expert bodies should be to examine the project clearance in a timely manner using technology and knowledge. So this is the proposal. So by this recommendation, the committee envisions to provide a single window clearance. Moving on to the second recommendation. See, to accelerate the environmental decision-making process, they suggested a fast-track procedure for linear projects, power and mining projects and for projects of national importance. So this is the second recommendation. Moving on to the third one, the committee also recommended to subsume both the Air Act and the Water Act within the Environment Protection Act. The next one, apart from this, we know that both the existing Central Pollution Control Board and the State Pollution Control Board monitors and regulates the conditions imposed on the industries to safeguard the environment. So here the committee proposed to integrate these two boards that is the Central Pollution Control Board and the State Pollution Control Board with the National Environment Management Authority and the State Environment Management Authority once the new bodies come into existence. So this is the fourth recommendation which says to integrate pollution control boards with the management authorities that was recommended by the committee. Moving on to the next recommendation, it also suggested an appellate mechanism against the decisions of the Environment Management Authorities at the central and state level or the Ministry of Environment in respect of project clearance prescribing a three-month deadline to dispose of appeals. Moving on to the next one, the report also recommends that an environmental reconstruction cost should be assessed for each project on the basis of the damage caused by it to the environment and this should be added into the cost of the project. This cost has to be recovered as a cess or duty from the project proponent during the life of the project. Let's see the next recommendation. It proposed establishing a National Environment Research Institute on the lines of Indian Council of Forestry Research and Education to promote the use of high-tech in environmental governance. And finally, it recommended the creation of an Indian Environment Service to recruit qualified and skilled human resources in the environment sector. 
So these are the major recommendations given by the Subramanian Committee. Now comes the important question: whether the report has been accepted by the government or not. See, the centre never formally accepted this report, and neither constituted a new committee as recommended by the Parliamentary Standing Committee. However, many of these ideas are making their way into the environmental regulatory process without being explicitly stated. The government has suggested changes to the Forest Conservation Act, and also the government established timelines for expert committees assessing the feasibility of the infrastructure projects, and has worked to make current legislation more, more compatible with the court judgments. So that's all about this article discussion. See, as far as prelims is concerned, you have to remember that Subramanian Committee is related to environment. And as far as mains is concerned, you can mention these recommendations in the environment-related policy measures as a way forward to enrich your answer. So, with this, we have come to the end. Let's have a quick recap. What all we saw? We saw what is this TSR Subramanian Committee? We saw that it was set up in August 2014. It was set up to review the country's green laws and procedures followed by the Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. And after that, we saw some of the recommendations, which are a proposal for Environmental Laws Management Act, under which two expert bodies should be established, which are the National Environment Management Authority and the State Environmental Management Authority. And the second recommendation is to have a fast track procedure for linear projects, power mining projects, and for projects of national importance. The third recommendation is to subsume both the Air Act and the Water Act within the. Environment Protection Act fourth recommendation is to integrate the two pollution control boards that is the central and state pollution control boards with the state and central environment management authority the fifth recommendation is to have an appellate mechanism against the decisions of environment management authorities or the environment ministry the sixth recommendation is that to have an environmental reconstruction cost assessed on the basis of damage caused by it to the environment the seventh recommendation is that to establish a national environment research institute to promote the use of high technology in environmental governance and finally it recommended the creation of an indian environment service so with these key takeaway points let's move on to the next article discussion see this news article here it talks about a hologram of netaji subhash chandra bose It was unveiled by Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the India Gate in New Delhi. See, it was unveiled yesterday, that is on 23rd January, to celebrate the 125th birth anniversary of Netaji, who was a great freedom fighter. See, in this context, let us discuss in brief about the Parakram Divas. But our main discussion today will be on Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, which will be relevant to prelims preparation. Now, let us start our discussion. The hologram of Netaji was unveiled on Parakram Divas or the Courage Day. So, what is so special about this Parakram Divas? See, in order to honor and remember Netaji's spirit and selfless service to the nation, his birthday, that is the twenty-third January, is marked as the Parakram Divas. This was announced by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi in the year two thousand twenty-one to inspire the people of India. especially the youth and to infuse in them a spirit of patriotic fervor now let us discuss some important facts about netaji which will be useful for your prelims subhash chandra bose affectionately called as netaji was one of the most prominent leaders of indian freedom struggle he was born on january 23rd 1897 in orissa he was strongly influenced by swami vivekananda's teachings and was known for his patriotic zeal as a student see he went to england to compete for the indian civil services and he came out fourth in the merit order of the ics exam held on 1920 however having deeply disturbed by the jallian wala bag massacre he left his civil services apprenticeship midway and returned to india in 1921 After returning to India under the influence of Mahatma Gandhi he joined the Indian National Congress he started working under Deshbandhu Chitranjan Das whom he later acknowledged as his political guru then in 1928 when Motilal Nehru committee declared in favor of the dominion status Subhash Chandra Bose along with the Jawaharlal Nehru opposed it we all know why 
because both that is both subhash chandra bose and jawaharlal nehru asserted that they would be satisfied with nothing short of complete independence for india note that he was jailed during civil disobedience movement in 1930 he was released in 1931 after gandhi irwin pact was signed we all know that a major provision of gandhi irwin pact was to release the political prisoners right and after that he protested against the gandhi irwin pact and opposed the suspension of civil disobedience movement especially when bahad singh and his associates were hanged he was soon arrested again under the infamous bengal regulation and after his release this time he was banished from india to europe defying the ban on his entry to india he returned to india and was again arrested and jailed for a year now he was released after the general elections of 1937 Then he was elected as the president of Haripura Congress session in 1938. During his term as Congress president, he set up a national planning committee. This is an important thing. When he was the president of the Congress, he set up the national planning committee. This happened in the Haripura Congress session of 1938. And in the next presidential election to Tripura Congress session, He was re-elected defeating Mr Patabi Sita Ramaiya who has been backed by Mahatma Gandhi and the Congress Working Committee These are some important facts that you should know Moving on See during World War 2 he brought a resolution to revolt against the British if they failed to hand over India to the Indians as there was much opposition to this he resigned from the presidential post that is from the Congress presidential post and he formed a progressive group known as forward bloc he was put under house arrest in calcutta in the fear that he would start a mass movement but he disappeared and reached germany via afghanistan he sought cooperation of germany and japan against british empire he used his radio berlin to connect with the indians and in 1943 at singapore he took over the reins of the indian independence movement in east asia from the raj bihari bose He then organized the Azad Hind Fauj called as the Indian National Army comprising mainly of the Indian prisoners of war. He was hailed as Netaji by the army as well as by the Indian civilian population in East Asia. See Azad Hind Fauj proceeded towards Indian liberation from the British rule. See the Indian National Army it crossed the Burma border and stood on the Indian soil on March 18, 1944. However, the defeat of Japan and Germany in the Second World War forced the Indian National Army to retreat and it could not achieve its objective. Finally, Subhash Chandra Bose was reportedly killed in an air crash over Taiwan on August 18, 1945. Though it is widely believed that he was still alive after the air crash, not much information could be found about him after this. So that's all about this article. Let's have a quick recap. What all we saw in this article discussion we saw that Subhash Chandra Bose was affectionately called as Netaji he was one of the most prominent leaders of Indian freedom struggle he was influenced by Swami Vivekananda's teaching he went to England to compete for the Indian civil services but disturbed by the Jallian Wala Bagh massacre he returned to India in 1921 and after that under the influence of Mahatma Gandhi he joined the Indian National Congress and he acknowledged Deshbandhu Chittaranjan Das as his political guru He envisioned complete independence for India. He protested against the Gandhi Irwin Pact and opposed the suspension of civil disobedience movement. And after that we saw that he was elected as the president of Haripura Congress session in 1938 and Tripura Congress session defeating Dr. Patabi Sita Ramaiya and he formed a progressive group known as Forward Bloc. And we also saw that he sought cooperation of Germany and Japan against the British Empire. He used his radio Berlin to connect with the Indians. He took over the reins of Indian independence movement in the East Asia from the Raj Bihari Bose. The most important thing is he organized the Azad Hind Fauj called as the Indian National Army. But however, the defeat of Japan and Germany in the Second World War forced the INA to retreat and it could not achieve its objective. And finally we saw that Subhash Chandra Bose was reportedly killed in an air crash over Taiwan and after this much information could not be found about him. These are some of the points which are very useful for your prelims preparation so kindly make a note of it. So now we have come to the end of news articles discussion session 
and let us get to the practice question session and today i only have only one prelims practice question this question is based on the discussion on netaji now let us read the question with reference to netaji subhash chandra bose consider the following statements first statement he lost in the second presidential election to tripuri congress session this statement is incorrect because we saw during discussion that netaji won the second presidential election to tripuri congress session he defeated pattabi sita ramaiya who was supported by mahatma gandhi so the moment you know that first statement is incorrect you can eliminate options a and c because the question asks for the correct statements now let us come to the second statement he fought for dominion status for india this statement is also incorrect because netaji fought for complete independence of india and he opposed the dominion status which was declared by motilal nehru so the moment you know that second statement is also incorrect you can arrive at the correct answer to this question which is option d none of the above now third statement is also incorrect because he supported the british during the world war 2 to gain their confidence is an incorrect statement why because during world war 2 netaji wanted the british to hand over india to indians and even brought a resolution for a revolt stating this but this was opposed by many so he resigned his presidential post so the correct answer is option d none of the above now today i have two mains practice questions interested aspirants can write answers to these questions and post the answer in the comment section and whenever we get time we'll review your answer so with this we have come to the end of today's hindi news analysis and practice questions discussion session If you like this video don't forget to like comment and share and subscribe to Shankar Ice Academy's YouTube channel for receiving timely updates on civil services preparation thank you